Welcome to Studio Chat, an entertainment talk show covering movies, TV, music, and more. Chelsea here with a special guest that's not only known for her acting career in the likes of Renegade, Halloween 4, and plenty more, but is also a talented writer, director, and producer. Kathleen Kinmont, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you for that lovely intro. Great to be here. <laughs> Of course. Thank you so much for your time. There's so much I'd like to talk with you about, but I think the best place to start is probably the present day and your company, Kinmont Productions. So I'd like to ask how you first got into the production side of the industry. Well, I think it's a it's a natural progression when you've been in the uh, industry for a while. I think if you're an actor, you eventually get interested in possibly writing or, or producing something and somebody wants to borrow your name to get something made and uh, you know directing is like it's that big helm right where you get to really direct the ship and and make all the decisions and and that's just you know it, it's another form of it I think I think every actor should be some member of a crew at some point just to understand that the teamwork the camaraderie that's really necessary uh for anything to get done and you know and i see crew members that uh work their way up into other job positions too like you know my brother started off as a second second on second unit <laughs> you know second <laughs> second director on second unit and now he's a uh, director of studio operations over at Warner Brothers. So people in this industry, which I really love about the entertainment industry, there are no rules. You don't need a college education. You know, you don't have to, you can start with one thing and end up somewhere else. And I see a lot of cinematographers becoming directors and producers and you know, it's just, I think it's just a natural progression when you've been doing it for a while. You like, you're in the circus and you're like, hey, the trapeze was fun. Let's tame a bear. So, <laughs> I mean, you kind of just juggle all the balls. But, um, you know, I, I love to create. I love storytelling and I love people. So I think that those are really, you know, qualities that um, are necessary for any of those jobs acting, writing, producing, directing, you have to have those like passions about you because you're gonna be working with so many different types of personalities and knowing how to adjust yourself and and go through the flow and get what you need to uh, to make the, the project happen and come to completion is, is a huge component of that. It's not just like, I have an idea. You know, everyone has an idea. It's like, oh, okay, we'll put it on paper. That's the big, that's the big shift between having an idea and, and getting something to the next level. So uh, it takes a lot of discipline, which I have sometimes. <laughs> and then other times I'm just like, I don't care. But, uh, I, I just love every aspect of the business. I appreciate every, everybody's input from props to wardrobe to hair, makeup, lighting, design, locations, the transportation, the food, you know, there's just, it's a, it's a big deal. It's like mm. throwing multiple weddings. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There's so many moving parts and people and literal parts of sets and everything. I mean, costume, there's so many things you have to think about, but then like you were saying about, you know, loving people is important too, because not only do you have different personalities interacting, but then there's the creativity element of it. And that feels a lot more personal to people, you know, when they have a creative decision. And if you're directing, you may agree or disagree with that. It's like, you know, there, there's certain things that you have to be able to handle with people getting into that kind of innermost part of the the creativity of them as an individual absolutely and sometimes the best ideas come from the most obscure places and to be organized with your own thoughts and to have your own real clear vision but also having the open heart and open mind to welcome other people's input and that's what makes the canvas so exceptional because you know, you have the movie that you write, you have the movie that you shoot, and then you have the movie that you edit and score. And all, I mean, the post is really where the magic comes in, the post-production. And 
it, you know, it all has to start with what's on the page, really. And then the people that you bring in to, to make that page come alive. And, and I just love putting people together. I, well, I love job creating. That's just a really beautiful thing. But, but you're, you're right about the creativity. Because when people are asked about their creative input, it is a personal experience. But the creativity in my eyes is where beauty rests. And beauty, you know, beauty is essential to our being. It's not just the storytelling and capturing history and 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 all the anthropology of it all of, of what and who we are and why we do it. And you know, those those are the things that fascinate us the most. But I think it's because when people are asked, <laughs> it's so simple, <clears throat> what do you think? <laughs> and in that moment, you have created the experience for somebody else to have this beautiful, you know, now they get to put dip their paintbrush in the, in the choosing of the color that they want and place it on the, you know, so that is like, and then everybody can go, oh, wow, that's really cool. I never saw it that way. Or or yeah, that's good. We like that much of that idea. And then not that, you know, but at least when people just come and they're encouraged to bring what they have to the table, I think that that's like, that's really such a cool, cool part of our human existence. It right? absolutely is. And I love that you, your passion about it comes through when you're speaking about it. You can tell, you know, how invested you are in this. And you mentioned that you love storytelling, and of course, and another fairly recent project of yours in the past couple of years uh, was your book, I Should Have Been Nicer to Quentin Tarantino and Other Short Stories of Epic Fails and Saves. That's a great title. And I love that you decided to tell some personal stories of your career in life. So what first inspired you to start working on the book? Well, I first got inspired to work on the book because I saw Quentin at the DGA Awards with my friend Tanya McKiernan, who is Stephen Cannell's daughter, and she's a director, and she brought me as her guest to the DGAs, and I said, oh my God, there's Quentin Tarantino. You know, I was in acting class with him when I first started out when I was 16 years old. And, and he was just, you know, some dude in the back of the class scribbling on a yellow notebook, writing his own scenes and, and just, you know, in my eyes, kind of essentially odd. And, you know, what are you doing? Like, why don't you just do the sides that they give you? And he wanted to do his thing and he wanted to do a scene with me right away. And he wanted to do a kissing scene with me right away. And I was just like, ee, 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 like Pepe Le Pew, like, just like, whoa, pump the brakes. I don't even let me play a screwed up teenager first, please, with a family. I don't want to be grown in a, I was just too new and too young and too too green to, but, but no, I wasn't to anything actually. What I was, was completely in my body going, you know what? I'm really not ready for that. And told the acting coach, like, I'm not ready for that. And so, so don't put me in a scene with Quentin. And I guess it kind of hurt his feelings or something. And he was, you know, so we never really worked together, but I always felt bad later in life because I see like oh my god now he's becoming this amazing writer producer director and he was being uh, uh, nominated for the DGA for um, Inglorious Bastards that that particular evening and and I told my friend Tanya I said god I, I should write a book called I should have been nicer to Quentin Tarantino and she goes oh my god you must and I'm like what write the book she goes no you must tell him tonight before we leave the DGAs if, you know, if you can. And I said, well, if he wins, I won't because he'll be too, too pressured with everybody. But if he doesn't win and he's got some space and I can see an opening, then okay, for sure. Because he knows who I am. He's He worked with K&B Effects and still continues to work with Greg Nicotero and all those guys that do all of his special effects makeup. And they were the creators of The Bride, of The Bride of Reanimator. So I know that he's seen me. I'm sure he saw me in Halloween for, you know, whatever. He's, it's hard to, you know, when you, when you kind of start off, you, you tend to remember all the people that you started off with. And when you see them hit, you're like, oh my God, I knew them when. So I walked over and I was feeling pretty good because I was in a nice gown. <laughs> 
and he sees me coming over and he's like oh my god Kathleen and I was like oh yeah he know he remembers me and then I said congratulations obviously on the nomination and and everything in your career you're just so amazing and I'm so impressed with how great you've become I, I've decided I'm going to write a book called I should have been nicer to Quentin Tarantino and he was like ha 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 that's so funny you know? and I was like maybe that's a pretty good title for a book. <laughs> it's like and the more you said it out loud the more you're like that works doesn't it <laughs> yeah you know it's just like it, it's just funny because Quentin <laughs> You know, he's known for these, you know, pornographically violent films. I mean, they're just so over the top with the flame throwing and the, you know, appendage chopping. And then, you know, they're great, uh, but they're just, you know, wildly violent. And uh, so it kind of makes sense. Like, oh, I should have been nice at the Quinn's. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm getting a dog canned food like shoved in my mouth. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, and then I thought like, well, that is really, the whole title is about a regret of mine, something that I wish I could have had a do over, like, well, what would I have done over? Would I have made out with him when I wasn't ready? And I, you know, feeling really awkward. I mean, I was already felt like I was pushing myself into places that were unknown territory enough you know like they say do something that scares you every day well I was terrified already <laughs> being in an acting class with adults that are working actors rec some of them are recognizable some people I don't know who they are but still you're already like a fish out of water and I'm riding my bike there you know so I'm not I'm not real adult yet or savvy enough to kind of fake it till you make it I was just like nervous and um and that made me more nervous so at least I was able to say no you know and that's a really important thing for a woman like hmm, I've thought about it and no I don't want to so and I'm going to make sure I don't have to I'm going to alert somebody else to have my back so that I'm not pressured into this Right. Exactly. So in hindsight, when I started thinking about this, I was like, wow, this is like a lessons learned. This could be a self-help book to help myself and to write stories that are painful, embarrassing, regrets. But all of that stuff has been my greatest life lesson. And what was the epic fail? Like, I'm still here. I'm still writing about it. So there wasn't like, I mean, epic fail is I died, right? <laughs> but I didn't get to write about it. But like, what was the epic fail? What was the loss? And then what was the save? Because I'm still here. Like, how did I survive it? And then what is the ultimate lesson learned? So that's how I structured the book. There's 52 chapters. They're all short stories, so you can, you can flip through it, and there's no chronological order. It's just like a kaleidoscope of experience. And I really was, I mean, and I chose 52 because 52 weeks in a year, 52 cards in a deck. At the time, I was 52. <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, all right, there's got to be a cutoff number here. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I dedicated it to my mom and my dad and my daughter. And, and I'm just, I'm really proud of it. I self-published it. I did the Audible. I read it over COVID. So it's all available on Amazon, Kindle and, and Audible. And, uh, and I also have a children's book too, which is really sweet, Magic and Beauty. It's about the creation of the world with a Pegasus and a unicorn. The Pegasus, he has powers, the unicorn, she has, or no, the peg. excuse me, the unicorn, he has powers with his golden horn, and the Pegasus, she has needs. So, you know, oh, I'm cold, I need fire, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same way every caveman figured it out for the girl and the, <laughs> he was trying to impress. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> That's so, true. yeah, it's really sweet. Um, but yeah, it, it, Quentin Tarantino book took uh, a good decade from start to finish. Uh, I saw him in 2010 at the DJs and I released it in 2020 during COVID. And um, yeah, 
it's it's something I'm proud of because I got up every morning at 5 a.m. and wrote for an hour, set my alarm clock, and like stopped. And and that's a for me it was a really great way to write because easily nine and a half out of ten times I would the alarm clock would go off and I'd still be writing and I'd be like, ah, <laughs> but at least then I knew where I would be going into the next day, you know, like, yes. oh, I can finish that thought. So like cut off, you know, so, and I mean, maybe half a time I'd be like, oh, good God, I got through it. But, <laughs> you know, one hour a day, you know, most mornings I would say, and then I would go back to sleep for an hour and then I would get up and take my kid to school and and then start the rest of your day. Now that's great. I mean, that's definitely, you know, a very disciplined way of doing it, but in a way, like you just said, it fuels the creativity because if you do cut it off, you're like, okay, well now I got fresh ideas ready to go. You're like excited to start the next day instead of being like, oh my God, 5 a.m. the next day, you know, it's, you know, you're excited to go into it with fresh ideas that I'm sure you spend the rest of the day being, you know, adding to it throughout the day. Oh, for sure. Yes. Making notes, uh, you know, on my phone or post-its and, and yeah, so and and I was telling stories that happened to me, so it wasn't too hard to draw on. Like, hmm, and then what happened? You know, right. it, not it's fiction. More like, oh God, I got. Am I going to be? How honest am I going to be in this one? <laughs> you know, right. and who am I? Who do I have to be very cautious of not damaging any current relationships? Because I still have a relationship with a lot of these people that are in my book. And I don't, I didn't do this. This isn't a sour grapes book. And this isn't like some expose on Hollywood or anything. This is just more of like a, an, well, it's an expose on myself. And right. it's more personal than that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm throwing myself under the bus multiple times. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's, Look, I, I don't know what people's view of me is really because A, it's none of my business what anybody thinks about me. And that's a good attitude and, to have. <laughs> right. It's none of my business. If if you want to let me know, then great. And if it's positive, I appreciate it. And if it's negative, I'm probably not going to hear it. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, add I'm in- classically you know, trained that way. <laughs> That's great. No, I mean, it sounds like, you know, it was a really kind of immersive experience for you, you know, kind of going back over memories and stuff. Did you have to reach out to anybody and be like, hey, is it okay if I mention you in my book? Anything like that happen? No, I didn't. Because I knew that if I wrote it in a way where I didn't ever feel like I needed to let them know what I had done, then I haven't done anything that I need to ask for forgiveness makes sense yes and and it takes <laughs> i'm editing in my brain right now it takes a lot of editing and and you have to um because i'll, I'll tell you the only person i really kind of got very honest about was lorenzo mm -hmm. lamas who i was married to and while we were working on renegade we divorced and, um, you know, it wasn't anything that I wanted to do uh, at the time. And, you know, it really took me by surprise what was going on. And it was, uh, you know, I, I kept some names out, Just kept mm. some names out. Um, it's really funny, though, because Lorenzo and I, the only stipulation we had in our divorce agreement, which we wrote on the back of a script, by the way, you know, like what I wanted, what he wanted, and then what, where we were going to compromise, and then what we both wanted together, literally on the back of a renegade script in my makeup trailer. Wow. Right, right now. But um, also, I mean, it's it's the scenario you were in at the time, so I guess, you know. We were still working together. Yeah. So it was like, what's the most copacetic way we can do this without having to bring in anybody else because like let's not argue let's just get to a place where we can both come to an agreement we don't need to hire lawyers for that we don't need a mediator for that like we were still talking and uh so but the thing that we both wrote at the bottom was 
neither one of us could write a book and put each other in it. So he had already done his book, his um, Renegade at Heart by Lorenzo Lamas, which I think he had somebody help him write also. But um, but it was good. I read it and I'm in there. I'm in there quite a bit. And I was like, huh, <laughs> okay then. So I was like, free reign. <laughs> yeah, right. He did it first. He broke, he it, broke first. the agreement first, right? <laughs> right. right. So I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> that but, works, you know. and I also told him I said look I wrote some th- th- I think the first line I say is I love Lorenzo I'll always love Lorenzo he's been in my life longer than he hasn't been in my life and and I hope we are we're always friends but here's what went down and here's my version because <laughs> it's like history her story right yes good point <laughs> And his was already out there, like you said. So, you know, you deserve the, the chance to put out your own, uh, your side of it as well. Absolutely. So with that, and then I called him and said, hey, do you want me to send you the chapters? And he's like, or do you want me to send you the book? He's like, oh, just send me the chapters I'm in. I'm like, send you the book? Like what? So I don't know if he read it or not, but we're still fine. So that's okay. That's what counts. So that's good. (laughs) But another thing about, um, you know, speaking of the renegade time, kind of a a more positive angle of it I do want to talk to you about, of course, is your awesome character of Cheyenne. I mean, you brought so much to that role. And I remember when I first watched Renegade, noticing how much Cheyenne took care of situations herself. You know, she was rarely a damsel in distress. She was smart and clever, plus physically strong and helped herself without waiting to be rescued every time. That was my first impression. And, you know, like I said, you brought so much to that role with your beauty and your strength. And I just like to to kind of talk to you a bit about, you know, you your experience in that role of Cheyenne. Oh, thank you, Chelsea. Um, first of all, Stephen Cannell, who created the part, created the whole series, um yeah he uh, he has a daughter named Chelsea too so oh that's funny you're like, you're like, <laughs> yeah Chelsea Cannell and she does a lot of uh, on-camera stuff she's really great you Very like cool. she does a lot of interview stuff as well um I fell in love with that character because of all those things that you just said because she was definitely uh well tech now right she was a computer genius right like she was a hacker and uh and she ran the business and she did it so like well yeah of course i'm running the business bobby six killers out there bringing in the bad guys you know he's he's the brawn i'm the brains of six killer enterprises and and we complimented complimented each other so much with that because we didn't compete with that but because he was so strong. I always figured like, yeah, he showed me how to do the clothesline and how to do a nice jumping front kick and, and, you know, how to defend myself. So uh, I think that that's really where that character got a lot of her strength was from, from her older brother, Bobby. And I mean, stepbrother, because we were um, his mom and my dad, or no, our, I mean, it was his, his dad and your mom. That, yeah, that it was, was his it. dad yes. and my mom, right. So the the character just, you know, also had this very sad <laughs> pining for Reno Reigns all the time. So that made her, that was really the only vulnerable link that she had right. otherwise she seemed like this chick that just had it so together but you never saw her with anybody except exactly. for the couple times when she was like forget you reno i'm going out with this guy who's going to end up being a bad guy and you're right. gonna save me, but you know but it's going to be a really good one hour of renegade <laughs> <laughs> exactly no that's i mean that was it she she really really loved reno from from the pilot on. Yes. Yeah. You could tell right from the pilot because, you know, Cheyenne had that kind of sympathy and was willing to, to believe his story right out of the gate, which in a way also just helped the whole plot develop because her willingness to, you know, 
okay, I, I think I believe this guy, Bobby, like, let's, you know, let's kind of roll with this kind of attitude that she had, Um, you know, just open up that whole friendship between Reno and Bobby that ended up uh, developing. And then the whole trio formed, like, it, it's true, you know, that in a way, even that kind of emotional, I guess, feminine side of her wasn't a liability. It was an asset, you know what I mean, to, you know, the the business and to the storyline. Yes, and and the the moral compass for for Bobby to also band up with Reno to see that that Cheyenne felt comfortable around him and that and that for Cheyenne to see that Bobby had a camaraderie with him. So the two of them liking Reno or loving Reno and bringing them bringing him into their family and 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 then like you know Reno had skills. I mean, let's not you know forget like it wasn't just like oh he's a good guy, but it was like oh no he's a guy that is actually going to really benefit our business. That too. And then because it's a dangerous business, it was like oh shit, don't get hurt out there, Reno. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like, Bobby, go ahead, get those bad guys. But it's like, oh, Reno, you know, but he, he was able to totally take care of himself. But then there was just always like, I think the pilot ignited the pilot light in Cheyenne's heart for, for having hope for somebody that she could possibly love in a very um, kind of lonely way business that she was in like mm. they're bounty hunters how do you have time for romance I mean I don't know she just probably just put it out of her her mind and she just saw so many bad guys maybe never trusting you know there was there was a lot of layers to her but I just I just loved that she was also equally as capable as the guys and Absolutely. and could use her feminine prowess and sexuality in getting into places that the guys couldn't exactly right? so so girls know how to play the game 100 you know? percent, yeah we've always known how to play the game it's just that we don't like it when the gate when the rules get skewed too much and and guys take advantage of the fact that yeah i'm going to use my sexuality to to get what i want because that's what you guys want is my sexuality right yeah very hard it's very hard to find um a situation where it doesn't get weaponized in some way hmm. that's a good point because you know women are the women are the ones who who are ultimately the creators that's literally yes <laughs> I mean, now with the sperm banks we got going, we could pretty much do it without the guys. <laughs> right? I Except, mean, here's the thing that women forget, I think. We got to look around and look at all the buildings, bridges, roads. We, we're not strong enough to do that stuff. There might be a few women. That yeah, are some fine. definitely do it, yeah. Some definitely do it. Some are really strong. But for the most part... We kind of need them. <laughs> Lift it, it's about a balance, though. It's about, you know, them using their strengths, us using our strengths, and, you know, it, it coming together nicely, not one over the other. Right. That's the thing. Because, like, the feminism, I get it. I understand it. I'm an advocate. But I really think we need guys to help us promote feminism. <laughs> <laughs> they, they talk louder so people the hear them more, right? <laughs> I'm like, who's going to put up my feminist banner? <laughs> I think, um, you know, tying that back, though, to what, what you're saying about the character Cheyenne, though, you know, I think that she was not only well written by Stephen, but also, you know, well portrayed by you, because the fact that she was pretty was not something to put her down or throw her off to the side. It's like, oh, she's just, you know, the pretty girl in the corner kind of thing, which has happened right. in so many movies and media since the beginning of time pretty much the beginning of you know film that's always been the case you know that she was able to be beautiful and feminine and have that sexuality element to her like you said but still on equal planes with bobby a lot of the time that brains and brawn dynamic that sense of i'm right here i'm part of the action i'm part of the game she was she was like a cheerleading ninja yeah that's a good that's a good analogy i like that she definitely knew how to be on the sidelines for the guys and it wasn't just like 
you know, go, go, go. She was like, okay, I got this, you know, typing in stuff and, you know, coming up with routes to get to, you know, to whatever destination they needed as far as, you know, infantry and, and whatever scope, but she also knew how to action orient herself to, to get in there. And I think I, I appreciate that because like, I, I, I don't, it's like saying kindness is a weakness, right? Don't mistake my kindness for a weakness. Don't mistake being pretty for being, you know, like not weak capable. or something. Yeah. Right. Not capable, like, like not wanting to go get dirty, you know, getting your, your hands in, you know, get in there. And, um, you know, it's funny because <laughs> I, I, to me, I'm ultimately, I'm like a cowgirl at heart. That's, that's who I am. I'm, I'm an equestrian and I love horses. I love nature. I ride all the time. I'm, I'm out there. And yesterday my boyfriend and I were, were at my friend's ranch and, you know, I, I, I told her she's out of town. I said, look, tell the, tell the, the guy who comes in to, to feed and clean that, you know, forget it. We'll, we'll take care of it today. And, and he's like, oh, cool. What does that mean? I'm like, grab a pick. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> shoveling. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it, it's, I'm a mom. I'm, I'm, and I've been a mom for a long time. I have no problem with helping others and, and wanting to, uh, to get dirty a little bit, play in the mud. It's fun. I anyway, understand what you're I'm saying. I'm a cowgirl. I like to ride horses. I like to shoot guns. I like to shoot bow and arrows. I love I love ballroom dancing. I'm a ballroom dancer. You know, I love yoga. I'm a yogi. Yes. I walk labyrinths. I meditate, you know, and I like to, you know, go to hockey games and scream my head off. I'm a big Dodger fan. I love, you know, cheering for others. Nice. I, I love think, hockey. <laughs> I think everybody's like bipolar, right? Everybody has a North Pole and a South Pole on them, yin and yang. Yeah, different different sides to you, of course. And, you know, I mean, being one dimensional or only into one thing wouldn't be very much fun, honestly. Yeah. And Stephen Cannell knew that. In fact, second season, he called called all of us in. Really. I mean, separately, individually, and. Uh, you know, said so like, what do you do? Like, what are your, what else do you like to do? What, do, what would you like to do on the show? And I told him, I'm like, I'm a cowgirl. I love horses. So he wrote a rodeo show where I got to barrel race. And that's me barrel racing in the episode. And I got a 19 second, you know, time, which is really remarkable. <laughs> it's like, it was a real rodeo that we filmed in. That's so fun. And, it was so fun. And then we did a, a, a like a throwback Western where um, Reno Reigns has a dream and, and we're all in uh, 1800 period piece that I'm, I'm working the saloon and I, and I was able to bring my own uh, quarter horse onto the show and ride my beautiful Calamity Jane. That was her name. Calamity oh, Jane. That's so cool. So it was your own you know, horse. I love that. It was my own horse. Yeah. And you know, we just, he really encouraged us to bring like ideas and, and ourselves. So that's what you guys got to see on the show. You did get to see who we are and, and what kind of special skill set we have. And, and, you know, I, I think I went as far as maybe like a yellow belt in karate. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's cool. the second belt. I don't even, <laughs> I just didn't, you know, I was like, I don't really have time to test. Just teach me the fight scene. And I'll, I'll learn it. And um, so I learned a lot of TV karate, a lot of film karate, working with different uh, choreograph fight choreographers on, on a specific fight scene and, you know, honing that skill. And But I I definitely would love to do a skiing film because I really love to alpine downhill ski. And I'm named after Jill Kinmont, who was a very famous skier. They made a movie about her called The Other Side of the Mountain, part one and part two. She was um, she was destined to be an Olympic gold medalist and fell during the trials and became a quadriplegic. Oh, wow. And then she uh, became a school teacher and really helped the, um, the ADA 
the American Disabilities Act with uh, wheelchair ramps for schools and parking lots and things like that. She taught in Bishop, California. I'm pointing to it like it's right over there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she's that's, she's my name, my though. middle name. I, I was born Kathleen Kinmont Smith, but I dropped the Smith for acting when I was uh, when I got my SAG card at 18. When I um, worked on Hard Bodies, that was my first movie. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <Great thing. laughs> that's you know, fun. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is your, your filmography is so fun because, you know, looking at it, it starts off as you were born, you're on TV. <laughs> the Joey Bishop show as a baby. Um, and then some time passed, you grew up back on TV again, back into film again, you know, and the Joey Bishop show, of course, makes sense with the, the connection with your mother, Abby Dalton being on it. But what exactly brought you back around to entertainment once you got a little older? Well, I did commercials when I was a younger kid. And that was kind of fun because I enjoyed the whole like, you know, playing with dolls and adults fussing over me and <laughs> missing school. There you uh, go. I mean, there were so many ideal things about it. Uh, and then, you know, you get a couple commercials and you're like, wow, that's great. And then you go through the, the period of having to audition all the time and I hated that part I hated the you know sitting in the office and and then I remember there was this one commercial where they they brought all the kids in and they had the parents already it was like one of those commercials where they morph from like an infant to a two-year-old a four-year-old five so they're trying to match humans right like this human looks like that human this human okay number two step forward three back no you know yes no i mean it was so it was like being in a in a cattle drive right <laughs> <laughs> it was just so uh i couldn't handle it i i, I was just because they were like pulling me forward then pushing me back then bringing me forward and they were like what do you think what do you think and i'm just like standing there at 10 years old just feeling <laughs> Like I'm on a, you know, an auction block. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you get used to it after a while, but like, I wasn't really, I was like, nah, I want to be an athlete. I want to go out for sports. So I kind of let the whole thing go for a while. And my mom was never pushing us into it anyway. It was just kind of one of those, hey, do you kids think you want to? It was just a different time frame too. It wasn't nearly as stage mommy, and and she wasn't she wasn't that stage mom to begin with because she already knew what it took and having to drive all over town and it's just it's time consuming, and if you don't have somebody going, I need this as part of my life force, don't do it. It's not worth it unless you already a have a ton of money, and you just want to you know, have it as like a side hobby or, or B, you already have another like super great gig that's making you good money. And once in a while you do this, but I wouldn't push anybody into this business. I, I don't say don't do it, but, right. um, but it's just hard on you. You got to really have it like is. the skin of a rhino and like the vulnerability of a butterfly at all times. You can't just be like, Oh, I'm going to do this business and, you know, and then have an attitude about it. You got to do this business and go, okay, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Where do you right. want me to stand? What do you want me to wear? How do you want my hair color? How do you want my makeup done today? Oh, I'm a monster. Oh, I'm a, you know, oh, I'm a crackhead. Oh, I'm a, you, you know what I mean? Like you got to be so willing to just be like pliable clay. Anyway, you know, at around 15, I was doing plays in high school and really digging it and just really loving the whole theater crowd and, and those artist people and, you know, just like learning lines and dressing up and, you know, putting on a character, really, because, you know, you put on that wardrobe and you're like, oh. This feels different. I'm a different person and I can talk different. Now I have, I'm free to be me in somebody else's, with somebody else's name. 
that in the yeah, well, so theater, kind of, theater is great though. I mean, I have a theater background myself and that was always so much fun. And I think what's really great about theater um, is the immediacy of the audience right there. You get, you know, instant reaction to whatever you do, which can also be a little scary sometimes too. Um, but, you know, that that's part of the fun of it. You know, whatever you do, whatever you sing or perform or deliver a funny line, it's like you get that that feedback right away. <laughs> They're right there to experience it with you. Absolutely. And, and film work is the same. Because the immediacy of your audience, which is your director, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's who you're playing. But, you know, you're like, you just want your director to love it so much. You want your director to be like, yes, good, moving on. Mm -hmm. That's that's like that, you know, that's like the, the audience going like, oh, standing ovation, we're moving on. You know? <laughs> that's how everybody in the crew feels, right? That's yeah. your audience is your director and your crew and you know maybe even your other actor and you get a high five from your other actor like, that was great you know those kinds of the that's that's what you do it for and I mean I and I just had that experience last Friday working on this film and and feeling like oh my god I got such a compliment from the other actor on set that I was like wow I'm so glad I came to do this <laughs> this is why I'm here I work for compliments <laughs> I feel like every actor kind of does in a way though <laughs> well yeah yeah that's like you said it's the audience it's the rush of the person seeing you create something being committed to something doing it in a way that evokes an emotion and makes them feel like, oh my God, I was just in the palm of your hand. I don't care what else is going on in the world outside me right now. All I'm in is just you right now. And that is what we love about being entertained by a story. I mean, you know, it's just, it's story. It's like, oh, take me out of the narrative of my head right now and take me on a, on a ride, Aladdin's carpet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that, um, yeah, Renegade did all of those things. It took us into a, a, a time of Americana that, A, everything that was on that show was like American made. Woohoo, you know, from the Harley to the Hummer to the Winnebago to our clothing to where we were. And they made it like, anywhere usa just super rural we never That's really true. knew what the, what the location was we just knew that they were in the good old usa damn it getting the bad guys and putting them in jail they were like, <laughs> <laughs> like well the theme song kind of has that uh that twangy vibe to it too so yeah. <laughs> That's my right post. all the elements my, yeah my post kicking ass on that you know ralph hemmaker uh, directing that beautiful main title sequence you know that that we love like and and now these days you know you just like get into the show right like like yeah, you just good jump point. in the show you see people's you know name card as they're like you know showing the murder scene you know it's no there there are a few shows that still do a little bit of main titles that are cool but um but renegade had a bitch in main title and uh the whole thing about the whole show was just, I just loved being part of it. And, you know, and then I got fired. And, uh, you know, we can thank Howard Stern for that. <laughs> no, I can't thank anybody but myself. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to blame Howard Stern. He just gave me the platform to really just say what I really felt. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, he was asking me the questions that were a little off color and I was maybe trying to know. pull it out of you a little bit too. <laughs> like, uh, Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, he definitely wanted, well, that's just who he is. I mean, that's right. his media show. He's not, he's not a milk toast interviewer. He's like, what kind of underwear are you wearing? You know, let's see. Oh <laughs> you know? Like, oh. But I, you know, I, it was it was too bad that it ended that way, but in in the course of all of that, it was ready. I was ready to go, and mm. you know, and uh, I subsequently still have friendships with 
Lorenzo and Brascom. Brascom, who I'm going to be working with again very soon, but I'm I'm lucky that you know it was just a great time. Absolutely, that show. That's really cool. Okay. Is there anything you can tell us uh, about that upcoming production with Branscombe yet, or is it still too early in the stages? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, called Kang- it's called Kangaroo Kids, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a children's movie, but adults are in it, <laughs> which is good because you know. Kids have a really hard time making their own movies. Yeah, especially not yeah. these days, though, with the cell phones and everything. I'm sure they're making stuff, TikTok right? and everything. Like every everybody's, you know, of all ages is making content, you know, short films, everything. It's great. I love it. I love it. It's as there, there's <laughs> the table it has limitless space. There's no, you know, there's room for everyone. And if you've got something cool to show, then do it, create it, put it out there and inspire, right? Because that's that's really what, what is it like to inspire, entertain and educate? Those are really what the, uh, the three main goals I think are from this art form of media. It's not a canvas. It's not, I mean, think about music. I guess it does the same thing. I'm uh, I'm definitely a huge component of the kids getting behind their own stuff because we can learn so much from the kids. Definitely. So and there's a lot, a lot of crazy content, not, not so educational content out there too, but when you do um, catch it, there, there's a lot of good stuff too, you know, just, the, I mean, same has always been the case with film and TV, you know, there's been the shows that are phenomenal and, you know, resonate with families for generations. And then there's other shows that you're just like, mm, yeah, well, we don't need that one anymore. <laughs> like it, it always happens, you know, on, in any kind of media, there's definitely the ones that last and like you just said inspire and educate and in terms of the the productions that you've done you've had such a, a wide range of everything from you know renegade which did resonate with people does have a legacy that's last and then you have the whole horror element of course halloween 4 bride of reanimator um which was a, a terrifying role visually that must have been some pretty intense uh, costume and makeup to get into for that one it was it was about god five to six hours oh, of wow. getting ready <laughs> and then three hours to get out of it at least oh my goodness hours. and uh and then a 12-hour work shift in between so I was almost up like 24 hours give or take well, I guess yeah. that helped you feel more authentically like a zombie by day I guess. nine we didn't need to do anything anymore <laughs> I was just like ah! <laughs> maybe, maybe that was part of their uh their plan for having you in that role just you know make you feel well, as authentic as possible <laughs> complete and utter mess now those guys took such good care of me um k and b guys are just like oh you know bob kurtzman greg nicotero howard berger and their crew so sometimes i would have like six or seven people working on me at once which was, yeah it wasn't like a massage it was more like <laughs> putting crazy bloody body parts on you and stuff yeah right? and, and you just kind of like get lost in yourself when people are just like you know doing stuff to your face you know you've just got hands all over somebody's gluing or applicating or painting on you or right or putting blood in or gooping it or I mean it was just it was probably like where I you know I I didn't even really know what transcendental meditation was at that point in my life but I think that I just kind of naturally went there Mm. like if you're you know and I knew I was going to be okay and they would talk to me and you know we'd laugh and giggle and it was just uh, really quite an interesting time. It's hard for me to really remember too much of it because I think I was so outside of my body having to um, 
you know, as an actor trying to focus on like all the different body parts for one that were moving, you know, not in sync with each other. <laughs> so you're just like, uh -uh, uh -uh. and so that was a challenge. And then having to emote and then having to uh, wait in between takes and then like, it's lunch. And then you're like, what am I gonna do with it? I can't eat, I can't sit, I can't sit with anybody because nobody wants to be near me. Because yeah, it was visually like, uh, what's for lunch? And they're like, pasta. And you're like, oh, I'll be in my dressing room. <laughs> right. <laughs> Putting something on, getting something taken off. It's crazy. Uh, I couldn't sit down. So they built me a lean to, which was. Oh my gosh. Right. So they put like a bicycle seat with um, lamb skin over the bicycle seat. And I'm up against it. And then they put lamb skin on the plywood. And so I'd kind of get on this thing and just kind of like. <laughs> you know, take some pressure off my back, but I couldn't lie down. I couldn't sit down. I was, Gosh. I was really the, the OG hot mess. <laughs> Literally, authentically. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's completely wild. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, sacrificing for your art, like sacrificing all sense of personal comfort at all, just to, to get that out there. But oh, I mean, man, the thing is, yeah, well, the day one when they started gluing on pubes individually onto my crotch, I was like, uh uh. -uh. I was like, guys, I took the big handful of freaking fake Merkin and I went, oh my boom. God. I'm like, uh uh, -uh this is not going to happen again. <laughs> that was that because I was, that's when I started to kind of just like panic and not because they were in my no-no square, but because they were, it was just taking so long. I was just yeah. like, oh my God, I was, I was really, like, we don't really I need this detail. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm going to rip my own heart out of my chest before it's time and before the cameras are rolling. So you guys, yeah, <laughs> make a stop. Oh my goodness. They were really cool about so much stuff and, and the way the suit, I mean, I did like 12 different body casts before I even stepped on set at their shop in Chatsworth. And uh, that was a full day. Full body, head, screaming with my mouth open, with, you know, tube, you know, straws in my nose so I could breathe, but just like full on like, ah, you know, because my head comes off and, you know, so they had all these different really cool practical uh special effects stuff there was no cgi well was there i don't know but not really no i don't think so i mean i i would have to say no because everything about that i rip my heart out i'm holding it like this and the thing is beating in my hand because they're pumping a air tube you know into the balloon inside the beating heart you know so <laughs> it was quite a remarkable artistic experience and I appreciated every moment and loved those guys and I and I love signing for fans still because they're just so fascinated and and it's neat to be part of a cult film like that. Definitely. That's, um, I think, you know, I kind of went off on a side note there about, you know, the, the visual effects by, you know, saying Bride of Reanimator, but that was, you know, kind of the point I was getting to is that whether it's Renegade or the horror world or something, you know, think there are many things you've done that have a lasting legacy of some kind that people still are either finding just now or have loved since it came out. And then they see you and they're like, oh my God, you're that person from that. And that's great that you're able to, you know, um, embrace, you know, everything you've done and just, you know, have that positivity about it and happy to inter interact with fans about it. For sure. Well, it, it gives it a longer life. And, and that's, that's why we do it, right? Where you put the, you, you write the piece of poetry so that somebody will, will love it and find it again and, and again and again, and, <laughs> right? So that's, you know, we hang a piece of art up on the, the wall so that we can always just like look at it and, and admire it and 
you may pass it a hundred times just in one morning, who knows? Like, so yeah, and it's it's really neat that that people do kind of, um, you know, they, they introduce their kids to this stuff too, which is really fun. So I'm like, <laughs> like with Halloween four, which is a very sexy role, yeah. right? And that was like, I was 19. And Sasha Jensen and I, um, Brady, uh, he and I went to high school together. And so I had known him for a while. And like when I got there, we were so excited because I was like, oh, thank God it's you. I'm so comfortable. And he's like, yeah, let's go up to your room and rehearse. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, like so, <laughs> so that when we were getting to that space, we're not all giggly and weird and like, but more relaxed and into it and like, you know, and and like oh, this has been brewing for a while. And now we finally got this moment to make out. And so when I'm at signings and I'm meeting people that are introducing me to their kids who are like 12 years old and stuff, like the guy's like, yeah, man, this is my first, my first foray into the Halloween franchise was Halloween four. And you were like the bomb, you know, I'm like, oh, cool. And he's like, this is my 12 year old son. He thinks you're hot. (laughs) (laughs) Makes for a slightly awkward interaction, I think. (laughs) Happy leap you again. (laughs) Yeah, right back to that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but it's like, oh, cool. You know, well, I don't, after writing my book, I'm thinking like, what are regrets? Regrets are just kind of just like little embarrassing moments that, you know, most people a forget, and you know, like is that is any of that stuff embarrassing to me or no? I don't really have too much embarrassing film footage. I don't think that's good. And we we get to reinvent ourselves as often as we feel like it because we get to have a new morning every day where we go, okay, what's in front of me today? How can I, what can I do? I think one of the best things I've heard recently is that there are no enlightened people, just enlightened activity. Hmm, I like that. Yes, it takes it out of like, oh, I'm never going to be like, Gandhi, damn it. You know, it's like, (laughs) Gandhi's Gandhi. Gandhi did his life. Gandhi lived, walked his path. And what am I doing today? Like, what is, what are in my hands today? What are my hands doing? Where is, what is my mind thinking? What am I, what is my mouth saying? You know, all that, like, we, we say what we think and we, our habits become our, destination really so with that like for me I just I I love to work I love the work I love to be offered work I love to audition for work and get the work I love to be at work you know because I also really love to play and I love to to not to to be working hard at trying to get a job or, or showing up. Or, but like when I do it and I get it and I show up and I want to be on time and I want to I want to be someone who's like, yeah, that was great. What a pro. She did her job. Thank you, Kathleen. You're not an asshole. You didn't make us wait, right? She was like cool to everybody. She was nice. I mean, those are things that we all want to take to every job we go to, every place that we go to. What if it be like that when I'm picking my kid up at school? You know, I want to be that, you know, I find the only hard time I really have a hard time is behind the wheel, really loving the people. Who doesn't? <laughs> right. Because when we see inconsideration and dangerous inconsideration, it, I think it makes us all blow our lid. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that that's justified. Like, like I'll be in the car, I'm like, Oh, that's got to be a student driver. They're going so slow. Are they just me? And then you get pull up next to them. You're like, yep, I knew it. You know, there's <laughs> kid behind the wheel. 
the it's mom. like you're judging who's behind the wheel before you see them and you're like right. I, knew it. I know the type exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah like that's got to be an old person that's got to be an old person you know and you're like you get up there like I yep you're an old person you know? <laughs> so, like, so I try to just be like nah, I'm not gonna I'm trying to be, you know, let the other guy go. You see somebody struggling, trying to get in the flow of traffic. Let him in. Let him in. So that's that's where I'm at in my enlightened activity. <laughs> and, and in my... Chilling out on the road a little. <laughs> chilling out on the Just putting it out there. Like I get in, in my car. I'm like, okay, God, show me the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, but like... I really have been so grateful for the work that I've been given because I have been given a, a wide scope of of parts. I'm not I'm not a one trick pony. Absolutely. I'm not, yeah, I'm not just somebody who can just be like, well, all I can do is the girlfriend. Okay, and, and like, she better have her nails done. You know, <laughs> so, I'm I'm really I'm super grateful that I've been offered a lot of cool things and that and that my own management team sees me as somebody who can go in on a, on a range of all kinds of cool stuff and so I, I I've been getting some neat things lately and it's Great. been really, really fun oh, that's awesome. I just worked with Christana Loken on this really cool piece again and she and I work together a lot she's a female terminator from t3 and uh she's got a great movie coming out that I made where I play her sister and I actually it's in my book I did all of her stand-in work on T3 oh and so very I, cool yeah everybody was all buddied up on that film because everybody knew each other from all the T2s and T1s before with Arnold and everything so she called me up and was like oh I really could use a friend on this and I'm like, oh, well, how's that going to happen? She said, well, they're casting my body double right now, my stand-in. Would you do it? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. And it was great because it really helped me get through the jealousy I was experiencing when she got that role. And I was like, whoa, because she's 15 years younger than me and you know, they saw everybody on the planet for the role except me because, you know, whatever. But and she got it and I was really kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. She was one of my, you know, best friend, great friend. And that's not a that's not a fun place to be because yeah. you're just like, oh, my God, I, I don't think that I have control over this feeling and what's happening. And then when she said that and she offered me that, I was like, wow what a way to get over this feeling what a what an opportunity to like oh well you want to be on the set so bad here you go <laughs> so for six months we worked on that film together and we had a blast and it was just a really great experience and especially by the way remember when I was saying like every actor should be a crew member yes <laughs> That was really like my first foray into being a real crew member. Okay. You know, that crew makes call sense. was my call. And I had to show up, you know, makeup ready, ready to go, put on her outfit and, you know, start working with camera. And that was watching them build a shot. Don Burgess, the DP, brilliant DP. Jonathan Mostow, the director, brilliant director, you know. At the time, it was the biggest budgeted movie of ever, like $220 million budget for this wow. film. So it was like, whoa, you know, you were just like amazed at the amount of create, you know, the A-list creative team and their, their camaraderie and their teamwork and all their efforts and everything that was brought into that. And it was just a really exceptionally cool experience. But you know, that was totally hinged on jealousy. Yeah, but way, in, in a way that ties back into what you were saying about the regrets versus, you know, enlightenment that was a regret at the time that, you know, you wished you could have had that role, you, you know, wanted to be in that. But then having the the flip side experience of it gave you more behind the scenes on set experience and you 
after that, I'm sure got more involved with the directing and producing and writing and everything. So having that behind the scenes view probably fueled some other directions for you too. Completely. Yes. <clears throat> and it wasn't just like the jealousy of wishing that I had had the role. What I was really experiencing was her calling me and telling me like, right, oh, I'm going right. to do my Cosmic McGraw workout now. And, and now I got to go to my wardrobe fitting. And I'm so excited. Isn't this neat? And I'm like, yeah, that's great. That's, that's awesome. That's oh, cool. 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 You know, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to be that person at all because I'm such a cheerleader. And I'm always so, so hyper enthusiastic for my friends when they book a job because I know how hard it, it is to get one. You know, there's hundreds of jobs I wanted I didn't get. You know, we're celebrating the things I've done, but like the stuff that you don't get and you're like, oh my God, the, 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 the determination to keep going when you're on the rejection wheel is, is intense. It's daunting. It's like, you know, you just want to go, it, you know, but you don't because you love it so much. It's like, oh, you know. Right when I was getting out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happens with a lot of people. So they end up staying, right? Then, you know, just, just about to give it up. And then, oh, you got something and you're like, okay, well, this was, this was fulfilling enough that I guess I'll stay. <laughs> totally. And that was that moment when Christana called me and I was like, oh, I just, I just, I don't even want to do this business anymore. I'm so over it. Nobody wants me. I suck. You know, and then it was like, hey, would you consider? And I still had to go in and audition, by the way, for that. Ah, uh, okay. There were like three or four other girls in there. And, uh, but I mean, Kristan and I look alike. And, and of course, she was there going, like, hey, you know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's good. You're going to totally crush the competition with our relationship. <laughs> and, yeah, but it was, you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it, it was an enlightened activity that I was handed. Now I could have said my ego could have been like, no way, dude, I don't do second team. You know, I'm, I'm first team. That's who I am. Um, my ego did tell me to not be credited. Okay. So you won't find me on the credit. Gotcha. Yeah, because I was going to say, when you did bring it up, um, you know, obviously I had done a little bit of pre-interview research and looked at your filmography and everything, and I did not see that in there. So when you brought up T3, I'm like, oh, okay, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, mm, I don't need the credit. I got the experience. Right. And the the women who who did her stunts, you know, it's like, let's, let's let those names be the ones that people see, because that, that's... Yeah, and what I did was real work. That was definitely real work. I worked 12 hours every day almost, and uh, and it was hard. But, you know, I was a stand-in. I wasn't digging ditches, you know, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm eating in Christana's trailer every day, you know. So I, I had a nice air-conditioned experience, and, you know, we had a blast. That was, that was what was really, you know, and... and more than that, like I got over my jealousy. And when and when Christana read the book and saw that chapter, she called me and she's like, wow, buddy, I had no idea. I was like, well, I wasn't going to come into this job telling you, God, I was really jealous that you got it. And I didn't get it. You know, like. Of course not. Like, yeah. That's kind of weird. <laughs> interesting <laughs> but you know I didn't want I didn't add that to her already very full plate of playing that part what I did was my job I came in and I supported her and I worked with camera and then when she was ready to come out of makeup and out of that trailer I was like okay pal here's what you're doing and I would show her what she was doing from start to finish here's your first shot that's cool. Yeah. And sure. I feel like your your description of this, this whole experience is something that is good advice for upcoming and younger actors to take as well, you know, to not let the ego get in the way, because like you said, it ended up being a whole learning experience and being willing to do the work and doing your job and putting egos aside is what a lot of acting comes down to sometimes. And that can lead to other opportunities. You know, there's always the element of networking and meeting other people. And you meet people through even taking the part that you you feel like is, you know, you should never feel that something's beneath you, I guess, is really what I'm trying to get to, you know, for any actor. It's like, 
just just accept opportunities and keep going. And that's how you you seem to keep in the business. For real, because look, I met every producer. I met so many different people. Um, I don't really know how how it all, you know, if, if any of that really benefited me right now, who knows if it won't in the future, but it's just, it, it was good to be, to be in a place where I wasn't the, the shit, you know, like I was just like, I was somebody that was supporting and, um, you know, it, it, it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder that, that, that we can all step down and, and, and be that second car, you know, the, you know, in racing, how they have teams that, Yes, I was just watching Talladega Nights. <laughs> I was the John C. Riley. <laughs> Shake a bank, you know. <laughs> yeah, but true. yeah, like, but you know, and then second car needs to be first car, and she has done that for me. She has supported me. She came in and 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 worked um several times for me. You know, so. So that's really where, I mean, if anything, like the only thing that was really important to me was that my relationship with Kristana was so, so supported and sacred and that, you know, we got to like next level friendship, next level friend, you know, it, and that's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Like I wasn't looking to get like acting parts out of it or anything. I, I was just looking to just be like the, the best support system for her that would, you know, like this is, this is what a stand in does. And maybe one day I'll get like a really freaking rock and stand in that is just, you know, just such a, you know, got my back, got my sides, got my front, got, you know, looking up above, is there anything that looks loose up there? You know, cause sets are dangerous places. Absolutely. And you gotta have somebody like, you know, she did a lot of running, a lot of action in that. And so, yeah, I protected her. That's wonderful. I mean, it's it's been so wonderful. I mean, I feel like I've taken up so much of your time, but I love just hearing all these stories, all these wonderful things that you have to say, and I appreciate it so much. So I will uh, let you have the rest of your day back in a moment. I just want to um, kind of wrap things up by asking you to tell us what projects you have on the horizon, what we should look out for Kathleen Kinmont in soon. Oh, cool. Well, like I said, this great movie with Kristana, and that's called Vice and Virtue. I have a TV series called Phoenix that's coming out with Lorraine Price and Grace Byers. It's a uh, female driven, um, God, espionage, human trafficking, drug trafficking, uh, just uh, so many kinds of craziness things that are happening in that. That's really cool. Um, and I'm going to be working with Branscombe on this kangaroo kids. Oh, and I just did this movie about Ted Bundy called Black Mass. And that's going to Cannes in uh, May. And I did a movie called Aloha with Love with Branscom. That was like a Hallmarky type film. Um, but yeah, some good stuff. Very cool. Looking forward to seeing all that. And uh, I believe you have uh, some website and socials everyone can look out for to keep up with you. I have a website, KathleenKinmont.com. Um, I've taken a break from social media just because it was not serving me. That's okay. <laughs> On it, something like that doesn't even need an explanation. A lot of people are doing that social media break and I totally get it. <laughs> All right. Yes. It's good to take a break. It's called Disconnecting to Connect. Yes, exactly. So, but for now, KathleenKimmont.com, we can keep an eye out for any updates and definitely looking forward to seeing what you have coming out soon. So thank you thank again you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful talking with you and getting to know more about you. Thank you, Chelsea. You too. Thank, thank you. you.